Empowering the Athena Within, Women, Power, and the Essence of Competition. Discover how modern-day Athenas are changing the rules of the power game and why you should, too. Welcome back, my sagacious seekers of wisdom, to another episode of I4L, information for life, insights and ideas to navigate your world, tips to greatness. Today, we plunge into the depths of power dynamics and competition, focusing on the role of women. We'll explore how the primal instincts, often suppressed in women, are not just emerging, but revolutionizing the world around us. By diving into these issues from an alternative research-based perspective, as is the whole point of this podcast, we can have a more nuanced understanding of the modern landscape. The drive for simple narratives should never supersede the complexity of the issue at hand. If anything, questioning popular narratives keeps us from falling into comfortable, but often misleading assumptions. Therefore, we will also be taking a so-called devil's advocate on everything we explore today to provide a balanced perspective and to try to avoid bias as much as we can. Have you ever found yourself in a jiu-jitsu or MMA sparring match, staring down an opponent who defies your expectations? I had that experience with, we will call her Sarah, a small, maybe 5 or 6 dynamo, who reminded me yet again that agility and technique defy sex. She has the grit of a seasoned warrior and the grace of a skilled practitioner. And let me tell you, the girl has technique. So let's rip the gender tag excuse off of competition and power today. Historical context. Fast rewind not so far to the 1970s, and the realm of power was arguably a man's land. The power of women was largely in the background and not really recognized. Fast forward, and you'll find women steering the helm of multinational corporations, performing life-saving surgeries, and even being launched into space. According to a study in the Journal of Business Ethics, as of three years ago, female leadership in organizations had increased by 25% in the last decade alone, Eagley and Hellman, 2020. While it's undeniable that predominantly male-interested fields such as construction, plumbing, power line repair, etc., still aren't seeing too many women eager to do the hard and dangerous work men still overwhelmingly have to do to keep society functioning. Wall Street offices, Silicon Valley, and even Congress are evolving. A report from McKinsey tells us that women in tech had increased from 15% to 26% in just five years from 2015 to 2020. McKinsey, 2009. Slow progress? Yes. Training and adaptation to new norms take time. But this is progress nonetheless. The present scenario. Let's raise a toast to the women leading the way, shall we? Like the CEO of a Fortune 500 company or the leader of a nation. According to the Harvard Business Review, firms with female CEOs see a 6% increase in profitability on average. Noland, Moran, and Kutchwar, 2016. Quite the numbers game. But hold your champagne, the so-called glass ceiling might be well cracked in this country, but it's far from shattered globally. Women still make up less than a quarter of Congress and hold only 8% of the world's national leadership positions, World Bank 2020. We've got mountains to move beyond just this country, folks, and part of that is the need for women to step up to the plate. Section 1. The Decline of the Stay-at-Home Mother and the Nuclear Family. A Boon for Business? The Modern Narrative. The current discourse trumpets the decline of the stay-at-home mother and the nuclear family as an economic boon. With more women in the workforce, there's an expansion of talent, increased household income, and consequently, greater consumer spending. However, the economic benefits of this shift are not as unequivocal as commonly presumed. Research suggests that the decline in the number of stay-at-home parents has led to greatly increased expenses in childcare, which can offset the advantages of dual-income households, Hedgewish and Gornick, 2011. Moreover, the economic advantage often doesn't account for the societal and psychological costs, such as the impact on child development and family well-being, Waldfogel, 2006. More talent, more money. The idea is simple. More women in the workforce means more talent, which should translate into more profit for businesses and a more robust economy, Golden, 2014. If only it were that straightforward. An influx of labor can also lead to job saturation in certain sectors, 
Driving Down Wages for Everyone, Otter, 2014. And not all industries have been quick to adapt to this talent inflow, leading to systemic inefficiencies. Historical Context and Transition The mass entry of women into the workforce began in earnest during the mid-20th century, particularly in Western countries. This period marked a significant societal shift, as traditional gender roles were challenged and more women sought employment outside the home. Notable triggers for this change included the feminist movement, economic necessity, and, during wartime, the absence of men who were enlisted in military service. The latter is an important detail. During World War II, approximately 16 million American men served in the armed forces. This figure includes both those who were drafted and volunteers. The population of the United States in 1940, around the start of World War II for the U.S., was about 132 million. Therefore, the men enlisted represented approximately 12% of the total U.S. population at that time. Assuming a 50-50 split between men and women, 24% of the male population had been drafted or volunteered for the war. These figures highlight the significant impact of the war on American society, including the labor force. With such a substantial portion of the male population serving in the military, there was a dramatic shift in workforce demographics, leading to an unprecedented number of women entering the workforce to fill the gaps. This period marked a pivotal moment in the history of women's labor participation in the United States. We would be amiss if we didn't pay tribute to the over 350,000 American women who also served in the military in various non-combat capacities during World War II. Although overall, it was a small percentage, around 0.54% of women in the USA at the time, their contributions were crucial to the war effort and marked a significant change in the role of women in the military and in the workforce. So now that we have some numbers under our belt, let's look at the wage dynamics and market impact of women going into the workforce. Wage dynamics and market impact, supply and demand economics. The fundamental economic principle of supply and demand played a crucial role in this transition. Estimating the percentage increase in labor supply when women entered the workforce en masse during World War II requires understanding the dynamics of the labor market at that time. We can make a rough estimate based on historical data. The total labor force in the United States around 1940 comprised approximately 56 million people, encompassing both men and women. To understand the impact of women entering the workforce during World War II, we consider the increase in female labor force participation. Before the war, about 25-30% of the female population, typically defined as those aged 16 and older, was part of the labor force. This figure rose to around 36% in the workforce during the war years. Given that the total U.S. population in 1940 was about 132 million, roughly half of this number, or 66 million, represented the female population of working age. Applying the 6% increase in labor force participation to this initial female labor force, we observe a significant change in the number of women in the workforce. This increase, when calculated as a percentage of the total labor force at the time of 56 million, equates to approximately 7.07%. This calculation underscores the substantial impact of a marked increase in female labor force participation, especially during a time of global conflict and economic upheaval like World War II. This shift not only altered the dynamics of the labor market, but also had lasting implications on gender roles and the structure of the workforce. With more individuals, women in this case, available for work, the labor supply increased. Today, around 56.8% of women and 67.9% of men are in the workforce. Accounting for the fact that women are the majority population in the U.S., around 3.4 to 7 million more women than men, depending on the source, approximately 46.6% of the workforce is women. According to Otter, 2014, an increased labor supply, if not met with proportional demand, can lead to job saturation. This saturation, especially in sectors that saw a significant increase in female workers, could lead to reduced wages as employers had a larger pool of candidates willing to accept lower pay. This disparity meant that employers could capitalize on hiring women at lower wages, indirectly exerting downward pressure on overall wage levels. Basically, if Joe didn't accept $12 an hour, 
Janice might, not necessarily out of preference, but due to a myriad of factors, such as desperation, not knowing what the job should be paying, not negotiating a higher wage, etc. Certain sectors experienced more pronounced effects. For instance, industries traditionally dominated by women, such as nursing or teaching, saw different wage dynamics compared to sectors like technology or engineering, where the influx of women was slower. Long-term consequences and lack of checks and balances. The long-term consequence of this workforce shift without adequate checks and balances has contributed to broader economic inequalities. Without interventions to ensure fair wages regardless of gender, the overall wage stagnation and widening income gaps have persisted. Additionally, the lack of robust workplace policies to accommodate a diverse workforce, such as equal pay, maternity leave, and childcare support, has further complicated the issue. These systemic deficiencies have not only affected wage levels, but also hindered the full utilization of the available talent pool. On a societal level, this transition has sparked ongoing debates about work-life balance, gender roles, and economic justice. The conversation extends beyond mere economics, touching on cultural, social, and ethical considerations. Fortunately, there's been a growing recognition of the need for policy interventions, such as equal pay legislation, anti-discrimination laws, and initiatives to support work-life balance. These policies aim to address the systemic issues that have arisen from this historical shift in the workforce. Navigating the complexities of the integration of women into the workforce reveals a multifaceted scenario. While this shift has undeniably contributed to economic growth and societal progress, it has also laid bare and perpetuated systemic inequalities and inefficiencies. The importance of understanding and addressing these nuances cannot be overstated as they are crucial for fostering a more equitable and efficient labor market. Yet, as we delve deeper into the economic implications of this shift, it becomes clear that the outcomes are not as straightforward as they might initially appear. For instance, the presence of two income streams in a household should logically boost consumer spending, a vital component of economic growth. However, this increase in spending does not automatically equate to economic health or stability. The concurrent rise in dual-income households and consumer debt suggests a trend of living beyond means, as highlighted by Dynan 2009. This paradox indicates that higher household income doesn't necessarily translate into financial security. Furthermore, the expectation that more workers, especially talented ones, would lead to a surge in business productivity is met with the reality of the potential downsides of longer work hours. Studies, including Voidenoff's in 2004, have shown that the stress, health issues, and low morale associated with extended working hours in dual-income families can actually decrease productivity. Moreover, the perception of women's entry into the workforce as the addition of a new, untapped market overlooks a critical aspect. Women have always been an economic force. Previously, their contributions were primarily within the domestic sphere, engaging in unpaid labor that, as Fulbright 2001 points out, is vital yet often unrecognized. This labor has been integral to the functioning of society. The narrative that the decline of the stay-at-home mother and the traditional nuclear family represents an unequivocal economic win fails to acknowledge the complexities and trade-offs involved. The shift in the system does not necessarily imply optimal functioning. In essence, while the entry of women into the workforce marks a significant societal and economic shift, it's essential to consider the broader picture, which includes both the benefits and the challenges. This more comprehensive view helps us understand that economic progress and societal changes are not always linear or universally beneficial, and that they come with their own set of nuanced implications. In a nutshell, the narrative that the decline of the stay-at-home mother and the nuclear family is an unambiguous economic win overlooks a host of other factors, each with its own set of complexities and trade-offs. Just because the system is operating in a new way doesn't mean it's functioning at its best. Section 2. Meat for the Grinder. The Decline in Childbirth Rates Among Educated Women and Its Alleged Harm to Business. The popular modern narrative argues that declining fertility rates among educated women spell doom for the economy. A smaller young population translates to a dwindling labor force, a decreased consumer base, and a growing burden on social security systems. 
Contrary to this fear-laced narrative, declining fertility rates, especially among educated women, have some advantages. For instance, a society with fewer children to care for could result in increased investment in each child's education and well-being, Becker and Lewis, 1973. Also, fewer births do not necessarily equate to a labor shortage due to globalization and automation, Brynjolfsson and McAfee, 2014. The logic is straightforward. Fewer children today will result in fewer workers tomorrow, potentially leading to labor shortages and reduced productivity. Lee, Mason, and Miller, 2003. However, this claim disregards the global labor market. Labor shortages in one country can be filled by workers from another, which can also contribute to a more diverse and dynamic workforce. Osgen, Nijkamp, and Poot, 2010. The theory also posits that fewer young people mean fewer consumers, which could cripple economies heavily reliant on consumer spending, Jackson Howe and Nakashima, 2010. However, while it's true that fewer consumers might impact certain sectors, it doesn't automatically lead to economic decline. A smaller population could result in increased per capita wealth and better distribution of resources, Sobotka, Skierbeck, and Filipov, 2011. The theory also posits that with fewer young people to support an aging population, the strain on social security systems could become unsustainable, Teitelbaum and Winter, 1985. However, this assumes that the only way to support social security systems is through a youthful labor force. However, many countries are exploring alternative models like increased taxation or pension reforms to maintain their social security systems, Turner, 2011. In summary, the narrative that the decline in childbirth among educated women is bad for business is not as clear-cut as it appears. While it poses challenges, there are also emerging opportunities and alternative solutions that can be explored to sustain economic and societal health. Section 3. Music and Pop Culture, Encouraging Women to Use Their Strengths A Brutal, Unapologetic Reality Check Songs like W.A.P. by Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion or Stronger by Britney Spears have been heralded as feminist anthems that encourage women to be assertive and embrace their strengths. These songs often preach messages of self-reliance and empowerment, serving as modern-day battle cries for gender equality. However, while these songs claim to be empowering, they can also reinforce existing gender stereotypes. For example, using sexuality as a form of empowerment in WAPE may inadvertently perpetuate the notion that a woman's value is tied to her sexual desirability, Canal and Pierce, 2015. Additionally, these songs often promote individualistic perspectives on empowerment, suggesting that personal strength alone can overcome systemic inequalities, which is not the case. Feminine Wiles and Manipulation Tactics The modern narrative suggests that feminine wiles or manipulation tactics are outdated and ineffective, implying that women must meet men as equals in order to succeed. However, first, the idea that manipulation tactics were ever universally effective is problematic. Also, suggesting that women abandon so-called feminine approaches in favor of traditionally masculine ones can, in itself, reinforce gender stereotypes. It implies that feminine qualities are inferior and less effective for achieving success. Ridgeway, 2011. Additionally, tactics of influence are not inherently male or female, but are strategic choices available to everyone, regardless of gender. Sildini, 2001. Albeit one may have historically been more available and effective to one side, the brutal reality is that pop culture is a business. Empowerment anthems may not be purely altruistic feminist statements, but commercial tactics to tap into the zeitgeist and make money. At the same time, viewing these songs and cultural products as pure cash grabs can underestimate their potential impact on societal norms. Despite their commercial origins, they often spark important conversations around gender roles and expectations, which can have a trickle-down effect on society at large. Dylan Burgess, 2012. Women Meeting Men as Equals The modern dialogue often pushes the narrative that women need to man up to be on an equal footing with men. Yet, the suggestion that women should behave more like men to be considered equals is also a bit problematic. 
It reinforces the notion that the male way is the right way and invalidates the unique perspectives and approaches women can bring to the table, Eagley and Carly, 2003. Of course, this is not to say that women shouldn't be expected to compete with men, as the fact of the matter is that in an inclusive workforce, competition is the name of the game. Challenges on the path to leadership. With great power must come great. You know the rest. The pinnacle of success is often dressed in overwork and undersleep. For women, it's often viewed as a double-edged sword. Breaking the barriers often means proving yourself twice as much to overcome stereotypes embedded and, unfortunately, still sometimes reinforced by others. According to research published in the Journal of Applied Psychology, women in leadership roles often experience higher levels of stress due to perceived tokenism and stereotyping. Rudman, Moss Rackison, Glick, and Phelan, 2012. Section 4. Meeting Men as Equals the complexity beyond the catchphrase. The prevailing narrative suggests that the journey to gender equality in professional and social settings involves women meeting men as equals. It's often touted as a mantra, a simple solution to a complex issue. The implication here is clear. Women should aim to match men in every aspect, whether it's in a corporate setting, an academic institution, or even in domestic life. Yet, the fundamental flaw in the notion of meeting men as equals is that it assumes that the system, people involved, or the playing field itself is already equal, and it's up to women to rise to the occasion. Acker, 2006. The narrative ignores possible systemic gender biases and institutionalized barriers that can make it difficult for women to compete on equal footing. Moreover, this oversimplified approach reinforces the idea that male attributes, like assertiveness and competitiveness, are the gold standard to which everyone should aspire, overlooking the value of attributes traditionally viewed as feminine, such as empathy and collaboration, Eagley, 2007. Of course, with over 60% of college graduates being women these days, the playing field does certainly seem to be leveled in some areas. Although a personal thought, there may be an issue with allowing people to take out loans to get degrees they can never repay due to not being able to get a good paying job with a fine arts and history or gender studies degree. Something you could arguably learn through Googling instead of spending someone else's money and lining their pockets with the original loan and the compounding interest. But these are other issues we won't be tackling today. The idea that women should meet men as equals often operates under the belief that we live in a meritocracy, where opportunities are accessible to everyone based on their skills and abilities alone. However, the concept of meritocracy has been widely criticized for ignoring the unequal distribution of opportunities based on gender, race, and socioeconomic status. Rivera, 2015. Studies show that even when women meet or exceed qualifications, they are still less likely to be hired, promoted, or receive equal pay compared to men, for many reasons including generally being more agreeable and not negotiating higher wages. Carell and Samard, 2016. One part of a potential solution could be implementing mandatory financial studies and teaching people how money works in high school. The Toll of Leaning In there's a social narrative that if women just lean in, as Sheryl Sandberg famously advised, they'll be able to meet men as equals in any setting. But while leaning in can empower individual women to aspire to leadership roles, it doesn't address the structural inequalities that make leaning in easier for some and extremely difficult for others. Check and Blair Loy, 2014. Moreover, the act of leaning in can sometimes lead to a double bind scenario where women are criticized for being too aggressive if they lean in and too passive if they don't, as we pointed out previously, Rudman and Glick, 2001. It's a very fine balancing act between assertiveness and a-hole. Meeting men as equals suggests that parity is achievable by merely changing women's approaches. But such a narrative risks minimizing the structural and systemic changes that are needed to achieve true gender equality. It places the onus solely on women to adapt adjust, and conform to a system built on inherently unequal foundations, Rizman, 2004. And here's another kicker, the High Wire Act between home and office. Society, both men and women, often expects women to be the nurturers, the caregivers, since they have usually, historically as a whole, 
taken on those roles. If one has a family, how does one lead a board meeting and make it home in time for a PTA meeting? One or the other, or both, will inevitably be compromised. It's not just a women's issue, but a human issue, dare I say, a math issue. Men, of course, face the same types of challenges, albeit in different ways. The struggle to balance personal and professional life isn't exclusive to women, it's a broader human dilemma. Men, too, juggle a multitude of responsibilities and expectations, and these challenges manifest in various ways that deserve equal attention. Like women, men also grapple with finding the perfect work-life equilibrium. There's an expectation for men to be the breadwinners, protectors, and providers, and this often translates to longer hours at the office, among other things, which eats into family time. On top of that, social stigmas can sometimes discourage men from taking paternity leave or actively participating in child-rearing, as if these responsibilities somehow emasculate them. The stress of maintaining a high-powered career, especially if they are doing it in order to attract women, often takes a toll on men's physical and mental well-being. There is, unfortunately, a prevailing cultural narrative that equates self-care with a lack of masculinity, discouraging men from seeking help or taking time off when needed. Even when positive lip service is done towards self-care, the actual responses from their partners, bosses, or co-workers often speak far louder than those pretty words. Society tends to condition men to withhold their feelings, equating emotional restraint with strength. This learned behavior, often reinforced by subtle and not so subtle cues from their environment, to include, let's not forget at times, their own partner's reactions to their emotions speaking louder than their partner's words, jeopardizes mental well-being and erodes the capacity for emotional insight, vital for healthy interpersonal relationships, both in the workplace and at home. It's a dilemma that indirectly affects everyone, regardless of gender, yet often goes unnoticed due to a lack of shared emotional understanding. The very definition of what it means to be a man is under scrutiny and evolution, something we tackled head-on in the episode The Fragility of Manhood, Unpacking Social Constructs, based on the groundbreaking study by Vandello et al., titled Precarious Manhood. Men are expected once again to adapt to new roles and expectations that are constantly shifting depending on the environment, while also navigating the backlash or confusion that can come with rapid social change. This backlash has led millions of men to seek other jobs, communities, or environments where their contributions are acknowledged rather than vilified, where what they bring to society is appreciated versus demonized, either actively or through their experiences with others, often and unfortunately, the very people they trusted. The Double Bind If a man does prioritize family or personal life over work, he might face skepticism or reduced opportunities for career advancement. On the flip side, if he leans too far into his career, he risks being labeled as neglectful or absentee in his personal life, especially if there's a spouse and children involved. This juggling act is just one more of the multitude of reasons millions of men have swore off children and marriage. Silently, of course, or by saying things like, I just haven't found the right one yet, lest society label and demonize them once again. One thing is undeniable. A good majority of men are naturally hardwired for problem-solving due to evolution. Shared Responsibilities With more dual-income households, possibly due in part to the high price of housing, since the number of marriages are in fairly rapid decline, men who do choose to live with a woman and have children with her are increasingly involved in chores, child-rearing, and other domestic responsibilities. Yet these added roles aren't always acknowledged or appreciated sometimes leading to what psychologists term invisible labor stress. Of course, this opens up a whole other can of worms such as, if there's one earner in the household, should their partner charge them for the unpaid work they do? And if so, is that taxable? And then should the one earner charge that partner for rent? And are all of these transactions taxable events? Perhaps not a road we should go down, but I do foresee these types of question being raised in the future. Each of these challenges involves a complex interplay of societal expectations, personal aspirations, and the ever-elusive quest for balance, and many women deal with some of these as well, whether it's racing from a board meeting to a PTA meeting or choosing between a late-night work call and a family dinner. The challenge, irrespective of the details and differences between sexes, is universal. 
as they say, the struggle is real. It's a complex equation we're all trying to solve. Admittedly clumsily at times, since this is all new in human history, something many people seem to forget, and there is literally no manual, irrespective of gender or sex. At the very least, Flexible work environments can help a bit, since studies have found that flexible work environments improve not just job satisfaction for women, but overall productivity for all. Hill, Erickson, Holmes, and Ferris, 2010. By dissecting the notion of meeting men as equals, we can see that the reality is far more complex and nuanced than the catchphrase suggests. Gender equality isn't a zero-sum game where one gender's gain is another's loss. Instead, it's about restructuring the rules of the game so that everyone gets a fair shot. And yes, that might just involve questioning the rules we've long taken for granted. Section 5. Businesses and Diversity More than just a bottom line, the prevailing sentiment seems to suggest that businesses embrace diversity solely for financial gains. This utilitarian perspective implies that your gender, or any form of diversity you bring, is just a statistic that contributes to a company's profitability. While it's true that various studies link diversity to profitability, Herring, 2009, viewing it solely as a financial strategy oversimplifies its broader cultural and ethical dimensions. Businesses also diversify to reflect their customer base better, serve communities, and fulfill corporate social responsibilities, CSR. Some might even argue that such motivations are just as, if not more, important than merely raking in cash. Nishi, 2013. Diversity is good for business. This is the catchphrase that underpins most corporate diversity programs. Yes, there's hard evidence that companies with more diverse workforces tend to outperform those that don't. Rock and Grant, 2016. However, as is often the case, the truth isn't as rosy. Firstly, correlation does not mean causation. Just because diverse companies perform well doesn't mean they perform well because they are diverse. Cook and Glass, 2014. Secondly, focusing purely on diversity's financial benefits can lead to a tokenistic approach, where companies hire one or two diverse individuals to look good but do little to create an inclusive culture. Kang, Decels, Tiltsik, in June, 2016. Female representation. More than a number? The narrative often goes that businesses want more women in leadership roles because they've recognized that it's profitable. The assumption here is that companies are so rational and profit-driven that they would naturally choose the most financially beneficial path, i.e. gender diversity. However, this is at odds with the fact that the gender gap in leadership persists. Eagley and Carly, 2007. Could it be that businesses, like the people who run them, are susceptible to biases and irrationalities? Profitability versus Ethics Many argue that the corporate focus on diversity is a matter of doing well by doing good, that it's a win-win for both ethics and profitability. However, a focus on profitability might discourage companies from pursuing diversity in less obviously profitable areas or long-term strategies that don't yield immediate financial results. Essentially, it risks turning ethical imperatives into optional strategies contingent upon financial outcomes. Dobbin and Caleb, 2016. In unpacking the popular belief that businesses want diversity solely for monetary gain, we find that the reality is much more complex. If we peel back the curtain, we see a host of factors, ethical, social, and yes, financial, that motivate companies to diversify but just because the tune is catchy doesn't mean we've heard all the verses. Section 6. You'll be competing with men, understanding the full extent of what that means. This isn't a playground scrap. It's a chess match with stakes as high as the sky. In a world that's been sculpted, for the most part, by men for men, entering the arena as a woman is like stepping into a complex dance, one where your partner is prone to leading with their ego, guarded by centuries of precedent. It's not merely a turf war, it's a battle for a rewrite of unwritten rules, norms, and expectations. First and foremost, let's get brutally honest. The playing field isn't just uneven. Sometimes it's akin to playing chess on a board that's tilted 45 degrees. 
Women in competitive, traditionally male-dominated fields like technology, engineering, or finance often encounter barriers that can't be ignored, Eagley and Hellman, 2020. For instance, studies have found that in STEM fields, female names on resumes are less likely to get callbacks compared to identical resumes with male names, Moss, Rakusen, Davidio, Breskel, Graham, and Handelsman, 2012. That's the kind of slant we're talking about here. The narrative of the tilted playing field is often used to explain disparities, but it oversimplifies a complex issue. Not all women are equally disadvantaged, and not all men are equally advantaged. By viewing this purely as a gender issue, we risk overlooking other factors such as race, class, and educational background that contribute to an individual's opportunities or lack thereof. C.C. and Williams, 2011. The question of merit. Meritocracy is a term you'll often hear thrown around, particularly by people who want to believe the system is inherently just. However, research has consistently shown that what's often passed off as merit is entangled with unconscious biases and advantages. Sestil and Bernard, 2010. When you're competing with men, you're sometimes challenging deeply ingrained notions of who deserves to be in the room. The meritocracy argument is often disparaged as a cover for systemic biases, but there's validity to the idea that skills and accomplishments should be the primary drivers of professional advancements. The concept of meritocracy is not flawed, it's the implementation that often fails. Furthermore, merit is not easily quantifiable, and it can vary from one industry to another. Arrow, Bowles, and Durloff, 2000. And remember, if something isn't easily quantifiable, companies often aren't incentivized to bother. Then comes the emotional tax, something that research shows disproportionately affects women in the workplace, Thomas, 2018. The duality of being assertive without being labeled bossy or abrasive is a tightrope walked with no net below. A study by Rudman and Glick, 2001, found that women who exhibit traits traditionally associated with effective leadership, such as assertiveness, risk facing backlash for violating societal expectations. That being said, while women often face criticism for being too assertive, men are not immune to social penalties for deviating from expected gender norms. Men who display traditionally feminine qualities like emotional openness or sensitivity can also face bias, suggesting that the issue is less about gender and more about rigid societal codes of conduct. Vendello, Bosson, Cohen, Bernaford, and Weaver, 2008. And that rigid societal code of conduct may well be the root of most of the issues. The physical toll. In a setting where physical prowess is often correlated with leadership ability, women may find themselves overlooked or undermined. This is evident in sectors like the military or certain sports, where archaic gender norms still hold sway. Koivula, 2001. Even in corporate settings where physicality is less overtly relevant, elements such as height, voice pitch, and even physical presence play into leadership perceptions. That being said, in today's world, where many jobs are more cerebral than physical, the argument that physical prowess affects leadership compatibilities is becoming increasingly irrelevant. Physical strength is hardly a requisite for effective leadership in modern society. Cognitive skills, emotional intelligence, and adaptability play a far more critical role. Goldman, 1995. The financial strain. The economic dimension is just as stark. All women, as a group, an important distinction, working full-time earns 81 cents for every dollar men, as a group, an important distinction, working full-time make. Hegowitz and Williams Barron, 2021. In positions of leadership, the gap often widens, seeming to serve as both a symptom and a reinforcement of male-centric power dynamics or at least, that's the narrative to keep us from solving the issues of societal ranking of job importance. You see, while the gender pay gap is a real issue, focusing solely on it being a gender problem and not how we as a society value, say, computer programming over elder care, tends to mask the nuances. For example, the gap tends to shrink considerably to nearly nothing when you account for factors such as education, choice of industry, and hours worked. Blau and Kahn, 2017. The social element, goodbye old boys club. Women are not just competing for positions or pay, they are competing for social capital. The good old boys club has been a trope of male dominated fields, offering a kind of mentorship and networking often inaccessible to women. Abara, Carter, and Silva, 2010. 
However, the tired trope of the good old boys club narrative suggests that networking and mentorship opportunities are universally available to men, which simply and clearly isn't the case. There's no clandestine back meetings where all men are plotting how to stick it to all women. Many men also feel left out of these informal networks and struggle to form mentorship connections. McGuire, 2000. Yet, let's not wallow in the weight of these hurdles. They are not impermeable walls, but challenges to be dismantled. The rise of women in leadership roles has been shown to encourage more empathetic, inclusive, and effective management styles. Eagley, Johansson Schmidt, and Van Engen, 2003. On the other hand, while the presence of more women in leadership roles is applauded, saying it leads to more empathetic and inclusive leadership styles can be a form of gender stereotyping and may simply not be true, especially when one sees the so-called rope ladder effect. This is when a woman gains power and pulls the ladder up after herself instead of embracing competition with other women and mentoring them. Of course, this is not a generalization across women leaders, but due to fewer women in leadership roles, when it does happen, it becomes far more visible. Competence and leadership capabilities are individual characteristics and should not be generalized based on gender. Igli, Karu, and Mechahane, 1995. So how do you play the game? Step in armed with information. Step in knowing the game may be rigged, but not unbeatable. Forge alliances with both men and women who get it. Take the mentorship when it's offered, and offer it when you can. Most importantly, never, ever underestimate the power of being underestimated. Dealing with criticism, societal expectations, and personal aspirations. Criticism, that ever-present shadow that stalks the successful. For women, it comes with an extra layer of bias, a garnish of societal expectations. You're too bossy, too emotional, not emotional enough. It's a circus. Research indicates that women are more likely to be criticized for their leadership style than their male counterparts, often finding themselves in a double bind. Eagling Karu, 2002. Updated by Koning, Eagli, Michelle, and Ristakari, 2011. As it has been pointed out, it's a fine line to walk between being assertive and being an a-hole. And without strong role models in your life, it's easy to fall into the a-hole category. And let's face it, we all have them and they all stink. The Legacy of Leadership But here's the silver lining. Every truly competent woman who rises to the occasion, learns from their mistakes, figures out what they actually want versus what society tells her she should want, gets that fine balance right, and is truly happy, is a shining example for the next generation. The more women claw their way to the top, competing with their male counterparts doing the same, because, let's face the uncomfortable truth, boosting a woman by holding her to lower standards than men just because she's a woman is highly problematic and incredibly sexist to say the least, especially if you are a man, the fewer psychological barriers there will be for the young girls trying to figure out what they truly want and how to be happy by themselves. A study in the Journal of Social Issues shows that female role models in leadership positions have a significant positive impact on young girls' own leadership aspirations. Lockwood, 2006. It's akin to a relay race. The baton must be seamlessly passed. Women today who shatter their own ceilings don't just achieve personal milestones. They become beacons for future generations. Their triumphs weave a new narrative. Power is not inherently gendered, nor simply granted. And here's an intriguing point. Empowerment implies that power is given, as if saying, here you go, now you're powerful. But remember, power that's given can just as easily be revoked. That's the subtlety of language for you. And never underestimate the influences of neurolinguistic programming. It's a phenomenon grounded in science. Let's continue. Findings in the Psychology of Women Quarterly underscore the significance of having role models who are both visible and accessible. This is crucial in cultivating a sense of empowerment among young women, Stout, Dasgupta, Hunzinger, and McManus, 2011. And there's that term again, empowerment. It almost sounds as though power is a handout, doesn't it? As if one must meekly request, please, may I have some more power? It's an absurd notion, to be sure. On the other side of the coin, these role models have a responsibility to mentor others, not just climb the ranks and then pull up the ladder behind them. Personal Experience – Embracing Competition So back to the sparring ring, a theater of primal instincts. Competition isn't about gender. It's about strategy, technique, agility, and above all, 
the will and the heart to win. Sarah showed me that she has it in spades, not just through her skill, but through her relentless drive. And she's not the only woman I've encountered like this. There were a lot in the military. Sadly, the civilian world seems to be grossly lacking in that department. It's a massive disappointment, indeed, when you are a person who craves true, equal partnership in every sense of the word. Now, here's a kick in the teeth for you. A healthy dose of competition can make you not just a better fighter, but a better human. It shapes you, gives you a framework to evaluate yourself, and pushes you to be better. According to a study published in Sports Medicine, competition can have several psychological benefits, including increased self-esteem and mental well-being. Sarazen, Valorand, Gillette, Palantir, and Curry, 2002. Of course, when it comes to mental well-being, using just competition as a driver is a massive crutch. Therapy and gaining true insight into ourselves is at least equally important, if not more so. It is vital to know the why of why you are competing. Oh, the age-old myth that competition is a man's domain. Let's shatter that once and for all. Competitive spirit is the human spirit. A study published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology finds no gender differences in competitiveness when social and cultural variables are controlled for. Nisi, Naderli, and Rostashini, 2003. Closing thoughts. All right, let's wrap this up by saying it's high time more women not just step into the arena, but own it. To women, the gauntlet has been thrown, and it's your name written all over it. Grab it, claim it, and make it your own. In our journey for equal opportunities and personal growth, it's crucial to understand the balance between aspirations and societal expectations. The idea of choosing a traditional role, like being a dedicated homemaker, is completely valid. However, in today's economic landscape, finding a partner who can solely support such a lifestyle, not to mention want to support that lifestyle, can be challenging. These ideal partners, if they're not already committed, might have different life goals. This example isn't about pointing fingers or assigning blame, it's about recognizing the complexities of modern relationships and aspirations. Let's consider this through a personal lens. I once had a conversation with a highly successful ex-partner who confided in me her desires to embrace a traditional homemaker role, yet she struggled to find a partner who supported this dream. This conversation opened my eyes to the unique challenges individuals face, irrespective of their success in other areas of their life. Speaking of personal experiences, I've done some interesting math to understand my own chances of finding an quote-unquote ideal partner. It's not about money or commonly sought after physical attributes, but more about compatibility and lifestyle and values. For instance, my ideal partner would be a woman around my age, at least five foot 10, physically active, emotionally mature, open to ethical non-monogamy, and so on. When you start calculating the probabilities, factoring in these traits, you realize how rare such combinations can be. For example, only about 2.2% of women in the USA are five foot 10 or taller. Add in the preference for regular weightlifting and ethical non-monogamy, and that number drops drastically. This exercise isn't meant to discourage, but to offer a new perspective. It helps differentiate between what we think we want and what we truly need in a partner. It's a reminder that quote-unquote settling isn't the issue. It's about being realistic and understanding our own priorities. And on another note, when I share these thoughts and calculations, I often hear people say, you'll find her one day. But let's pause and think about that for a moment. Understanding probabilities and realistic expectations is key. It's not about pessimism. It's about being pragmatic with the realities of life and love. So to all the listeners, I truly understand the challenge. This understanding is why I emphasize the importance of distinguishing between our needs and wants in a relationship. This is also a form of self-reflection for me. It is recognizing that the likelihood of finding someone who ticks every single box can be astronomically low, often in the hundreds of trillions to one. It's a stark reminder to focus on what's truly essential in a partner. The journey isn't just about finding someone who meets all our criteria. It's also about introspection, understanding ourselves, and perhaps reevaluating what's really important to us. In relationships, as in life, sometimes the most fulfilling connections come from places we least expect, often with people who surprise us by how well they fit into our lives, 
even if they don't match every criterion we once thought was crucial. But it's not just about the individual woman. It's about creating a level playing field for everyone. To my fellow men, you're a part of this too. Equal opportunity doesn't mean less opportunity for you. It means more opportunity for everyone. Albeit, it does mean less jobs to go around and less pay for those working. Research shows that diverse leadership terms make better decisions and are more innovative. Rock and Grant, 2016. So let's forge a pact today. Men, women, everyone in between. To lift each other up. To be the wind beneath each other's wings. Or, if you're less poetically inclined, the booster rockets for each other's space shuttles. Section 7. Discerning what works. An invitation to critical thinking. It is said that the only constant is change. But how do we know when a change is for the better? How can we differentiate a step forward from a stumble backward? In our lives, both individual and collective, it's vital to have some sort of evaluation mechanism in place. A way to take stock and say, is this working? When outcomes consistently defy expectations, or when solutions seem to spawn more problems than they solve, these are red flags. If a business initiative aimed at fostering diversity results in reduced morale and increased intergroup conflict, we need to question its efficacy. Robertson, 2019. However, the key is in identifying why it's not working. Is it a flawed concept, or is it a problem of execution? If we can't get to the bottom of the why, it might be worth considering reverting to what was working before. Caution should be our watchword. Let's not sacrifice the good in the blind pursuit of the ideal. How we define working varies depending on the lens through which we view the situation. Humanistic level. Is the policy or change enhancing the well-being of individuals? Are people happier, healthier, and more fulfilled? Psychological indices can offer data on emotional and mental health impacts. Diener, 2009. Monetary level. The bottom line still matters. Are profits increasing? Are costs being reduced without sacrificing quality? Financial metrics can be a clear, though narrow, measure. Kaplan and Norton, 1996. Cultural level. Is there a positive shift in organizational or societal culture? Surveys and ethnographic studies can offer insights into how attitudes and norms are evolving. Denison, 1990. Environmental level. Is the initiative sustainable in the long term without causing environmental degradation? Sustainability indices can guide this evaluation. Elkington, 1998. Ethical level. Are we operating within a framework of ethical considerations, including equity and justice? Ethical audits can be a tool here. Crane and Matt in 2016. In a world as intricate as ours, the metrics of success are as multidimensional as our problems. As we tread the tightrope between what was, what is, and what could be, let's arm ourselves with the full spectrum of evaluative tools available. It's not just about whether something works, but also about who it works for, at what cost, and with what long-term consequences. So let's be unafraid to critically analyze the current narrative, measure it against various scales, and be prepared to change course if need be. After all, a ship that cannot correct its course is bound to go astray. Conclusion, the complexity of progress and the maze of unintended consequences. If there's one thing this intricate web of stories, research, and counter narratives should teach us, it's that we are all part of a colossal, untested social experiment. The dynamics of women in power, competition, diversity in the workplaces, and the evolving family structure are pieces of a jigsaw puzzle that we are all collectively trying to solve, in real time, without a guide. The climb of women into leadership roles across sectors is not just a victory for women, it's a win for societies that benefit from diverse problem solving and innovation. Hugendorn, Oosterbeek, and Van Prague, 2013. Women participating in competitive sports like MMA aren't merely adding a feminine touch to traditionally masculine domains. They're reshaping the very definition of strength, courage, and skill. Channon, Dashbur, Fletcher, and Lake, 2017. However, let's not blind ourselves with the glaring neon signs of progress while ignoring the darker corners. The decline in fertility rates may be celebrating individual choice, but it's also adding stress on social security systems and has yet to find a sustainable solution.
Teitelbaum and Winter, 1985. Corporate diversity initiatives might look promising on paper, but they risk becoming a commercialized version of social justice if not implemented sincerely. Kang, DeSellas, Tilsik, and June, 2016. The good thing is, for every step forward, there seems to be a footprint left behind, a nuance missed, a counter-narrative silenced, or an unintended consequence ignored. Whether it's the tension between work and family life, or the grinding gears between old norms and emerging realities, these are not just women's issues or men's concerns. There are human complexities impacting us all, regardless of sex, in ways we may not fully understand for generations to come. As we continue to navigate this ongoing, intricate experiment, let's bear in mind that any single narrative is a thread in a much larger tapestry. Our collective task is not to oversimplify the story, but to embrace its complexity and contribute to its unfolding in the most responsible and informed way we can. Well, you've stuck with me through this labyrinth of power, gender, and competition. Thanks for being part of today's expedition. And remember, every barrier broken is a step towards a world we can all thrive in. Thank you for joining me in this long, but hopefully enlightening journey. Until next time, keep questioning, keep challenging, and keep engaging with the world around you. This is Daniel Boyd, signing off.